Hello and welcome to Newspeak, New Culture Forum's weekly look at news. Of course, the news this week is of a different order entirely, and we're going to be devoting our program to what has been a momentous time in this country's history. I'm very pleased to be joined, as usual, by senior fellow and royal commentator Rafe Hadelmanku, um, Emma Webb, who you know obviously is usually the host of this program, and Dr. Philip Kisley, senior fellow of the New Culture Forum. Um, we're going to look at various different aspects of the past week, but I want to start really with asking my fellow guests here their initial reactions to what we've seen so far. Uh, it's basically just over a week since Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II died. Uh, words we never thought we would say. Um, Queen Victoria once said famously, great events make me calm. Um, Rafe, start with you. How has it made you feel? Well, um, it turns out that the Britain that we were told was long dead and gone mm -hmm. is alive and well. And um, I've been so heartened to see the outpouring of support and affection for both Her Late Majesty as well as for the King. And I got the first glimpse of it really on Tuesday. It was a cold, miserable, damp day and the hearse with Her Majesty arrived and I have to say it warmed the cockles of my heart to see the reception that Her Majesty's coffin got. Now, I'm an old traditionalist. For me, when you would see a, a coffin go by, you, you'd doff your cap and you'd bow your head. But time has moved on and we had this round, spontaneous round of applause and cheers, which seemed to be very odd. And a thousand spots of light from all of these mobile phone cameras. But then I thought, well, the sincerity behind the motivation, behind the action, was just as genuine mm -hmm. as, as a traditional way of, of mourning and showing respect. And times move on. And it just, to me, encapsulated the, the vast change that we've seen socially since Her Majesty has been Queen. And yet, despite how cynical we might be about the people of today, here there was genuine outpouring mm -hmm. of support and sympathy and concern. And I found that extremely heartening, as I did with His Majesty when he, on his first time going to Buckingham Palace as King, he had his car stop at the gates of Buckingham Palace, something we've never seen before. We've mm -hmm. never seen the car just stop and the sovereign to emerge from it and engage with his subjects. Mm -hmm. And it was, it was reciprocated. Mm -hmm. and, there was, and you know, for 10, 20 years, we have been worrying about the transition. Many people thought in the royal household, this would be a time of crisis when the, we weren't certain whether the people would actually accept the new sovereign. How would that go? And I must say, I'm sure everyone in the royal household is feeling very reassured. Mm -hmm. It's early days still, but it certainly seems as if the transition and the succession has gone as well as could ever be hoped. I think uh, I would agree with you that the, uh, the journey of the uh, coffin from RF Northolt to Buckingham Palace, for me, had an almost Shakespearean quality about it in mm -hmm. the rain. Uh, I'm thinking particularly of that motorway, the what we call the West Way coming into London, and all these people from 15 miles. Uh, Emma, what particular point has stood out for you <coughs> in terms of reaction? Well, I mean, just in response to that, I don't know if you saw the photos of the, of the ho people on horseback and tractors yes, lined yes. all along the motorway and that was very Shakespearean it looked like yes. something from mm. um, from from a sort of Shakespearean battle scene or something mm. um, so just just before I came here I got so sort of trapped in the crowds with the procession coming through and um, one thing that really struck me in line with what Rafe was saying was that on the side of the barrier that I was on so the huge opaque probably eight foot opaque barriers, hundreds of people who couldn't see the procession still waiting there patiently. And then this shush came across the crowd and everyone went silent, listening to hear the sound of the procession because they couldn't see anything. And then suddenly this cheer. And it was this it, just an incredible gesture of respect from the crowd towards the queen and the reverence of that. Mm. Because even though they weren't able to actually see what was going on, it was almost as if all of these hundreds of people wanted to show that respect and, yeah. and to just be present. And 
just the day before um, we heard the news of um, Her Majesty passing away, um, I was in a Bowood estate in Wiltshire and we were looking around the grounds and I was talking to um, one of the tour guides about the um, landscape was um, cr was created by Capability Brown and we were talking about the, the maps that he'd produced and that they just had these little dots on where the seeds had been planted. And so I asked her, well, if it takes 100 years for these trees to mature, mm. then Capability Brown and none of the people who ever hired him to do any of his work would have ever seen his mm. works fully mature. Capability Brown wouldn't have seen his own uh, creations coming into maturity. Um, and for some reason that sort of stuck with me and seemed really poignant because when I heard the news that Her Majesty's passing was imminent, I, I can't believe the sort of how surreal it was that I was sitting in Sir Roger Scruton's uh, office mm -hmm. listening to an opera performance that was organised by the Common Sense Society with Lady Scruton and we'd just been out apple picking um, in the orchard and we were sitting there um, and the first thing that popped into my mind after seeing this text message, I think it was actually your text message, Peter, um, the first thing that popped into my mind was this Anglo-Saxon phrase, weird, I think it's pronounced weird, thin, arid, which means fate is inexorable. And it's this sense of the marching of time. And like you were saying, Rafe, that when Prince Philip died, I almost felt that I was mourning the Queen as well as Prince Philip. And I cried so much, but I cried less on this occasion not just because I think I did a lot of my mourning in advance, but because it really was a case of the Queen is dead, long live the King. Mm. And you had this feeling of the march of history continuing to, 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 um, to go on. Um, and it's, uh, it's, I, I haven't really quite worked my way through how I feel about all these things yeah. yet. You mentioned the uh, tractors and the people on horses all lined up along the uh, road in, the, in rural areas. Uh, Philip, this isn't just a London-based thing, is it? Oh God, no. Um, I my response was I, I was shocked at how visceral my response was. Actually, it was a, it was a, a, a raw emotional response, and I'm not ashamed to say that I, I filled up when I heard, but I was quite surprised that I did. Um, I was thinking about. The Queen, and I'll come back to the, the, the point about other places, but I, I was thinking about the Queen as this tiny yet enormous figure, you know. Um, and I was thinking about the family and how their experience maps onto our own experience. There's something about it, and I said this over the weekend, there's something about it that is about the we. There's something that brings us together. It's 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 human and it's natural and and it's symbolic. Um, one of the things that really struck me was the fact that, as Rafe said, so many people have just responded essentially in the same way that I've done. Um, and I've seen that. I've talked to neighbours where I live in Leeds. Um, I've talked to people who I know in Manchester. Everybody feels the same. Everybody feels as though this is seismic, this is enormous. But one of the things that I really take away from it, and I think this is really important, we talk about um, a set of values on this show every week, don't we? Mm -hmm. Within which the Queen is at the centre and the monarchy is at the centre. Those, those are, you know, they represent our values, don't they? It's so lovely to see other people mm -hmm. act actively and publicly buying into those values. We think about this often in an intellectual way, but actually responding emotionally to it is so important because, and this is, I suppose this is where I'm getting to, it's the pomp, the ceremony and the queen, it's like an antidote to the poison of identity politics, isn't mm -hmm. it? It's the we rather than the me. And, and I felt that right across the north every everybody i know right across the north feels feels the same thing and it's and it's so wonderful that they do yeah i mean i think you know you're quite right this idea of the we that you talk about um i think this is extraordinarily powerful even when it is the we in mourning mm -hmm. um there's an oddly life-affirming feeling that yeah. you can get even in sadness it's actually. also the um the the proof of the value of ritual as well like mm. I was saying that because um, we haven't seen many of these rituals before 
You yeah. know, we haven't seen the accession And councils. yet it's something that it seems so natural to people to mm. understand and appreciate it, even though it's something that transcends explanation. It transcends obvious reason. Mm. Um, and that there, we talked about this during the Jubilee, this sort of transcendent familial aspect mm. to the relationship mm. between the monarchy and the people. Um, yeah. Well, that's why I mean, it, you're absolutely right. Constitutional monarchy as a form of government, as a, as a form, as a system, is a far more personal and emotional mm -hmm. and physical form of relationship than you could ever get into a, in a, a republic. Republics have a constitution, a written piece of paper mm -hmm. behind glass in the Library of Congress, for example. But we don't have that. We have a living, breathing embodiment of our constitution. Mm -hmm. The sovereign is not only our a, a direct tie back to William the Conqueror and Alfred the Great, but is actually the living embodiment of the collective evolution of our constitution and as a source of all power is the fonds and the fount of honor mm -hmm. everything stems from the sovereign and the idea of this woman's epitomizing it all makes us personally invested mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and as i've often said before on here we don't have a national day to celebrate every year we don't have a war of revolution we don't have a, like bastille day um, an independence day like July the, the fourth of america so for us, it is the royal family that is the focal point of all of our emotion, all of our patriotism. It's focused on royal weddings, on births, on coronations, on jubilees, the triumphs, but also the tragedies of state funerals. It provides those rare moments for, a nation, for our nation to come together. We don't really have much jingoistic, patriotic options in this country. Mm. And it's the focal point. And so when that is lost, the Queen's life spans one tenth of the existence of the monarchy. It's uh, incredible. She was to around think of it for a hundred years, and yeah. when the monarchy is a thousand years, you think, "Gosh!" Mm -hmm. And for better or worse, our collective memory is the span of a century. Mm -hmm. So that link of the, of the Queen's life, which goes beyond seventy years, it goes it goes to ninety six years, basically a hundred years. We think of her also on the balcony of, of Buckingham Palace with Winston Churchill, the last global figure connecting us to the Second World War. That is something so profound. And just the psychology of the fact that it, in our subconscious we have seen this woman's image since we were children on stamps, on coins, mm -hmm. on banknotes. On but you go to you go to Canada or America, you see it there too. It's ubiquitous, and we don't even realise the profound psychological impact just, this person just has had just in our lives. Just talking about about that psychological impact, I think this week and what's happened speaks very very definitely and very clearly to the human condition and that's two things mm -hmm. isn't it longevity we all wish for longevity but we all wish for renewal as well and I think you know um, the Queen dying and, and and the King both of those things together it's another a thing certain that we eternity invested. To it. it's another thing that we invested it, it, it connects directly with our humanity and us as people well isn't this in a way uh, I mean this is that that famous Edmund Burke quote, yeah, isn't it? Absolutely. The society is the people who came before. It's a partnership between the unborn, but, the yes, living, and the dead. And the people, a monarchy almost is a living embodiment of that. And that's why it sort of stuck with me that I was saying about the um, the capability brown landscape, mm. the the fact that you you would you know plant these trees and m make these extraordinary landscapes, but you're not in, you're in doing so. It's an act of faith it's an investment in the future it's something that is for future generations it's an entirely different way of speak of thinking that is em embodied in the queen herself of it's an entirely um different way of you know we've heard over the last um couple of days people particularly on online saying things about the monarchy you know well, what has this person done to deserve this mm -hmm. but that's actually that's that's from a very different way of thinking the way of thinking that is embodied in the institution of monarchy is is the, the very Burkean view that that these things come to you in life and you step up to them and you fulfill your duties and the Queen um, in, in her birthday speech on her 21st birthday when she said that whether her life be long or short that she promised to serve this nation and that was something that immediately people were talking about as soon as they heard that she'd passed away because she had done what she had said and she kept her word um, and I think that uh, you were saying this is the antidote to many of the troubles of our time that actually culture isn't some often people talk about 
things and they talk about values, but ultimately the way that you preserve a culture and the way that you keep it alive is by doing it. And what we've seen is that people have instinctively, something has spoken to the human condition, that there is something that to a degree it's like asking someone why do they love their mother why do they love the queen you know there's something that has brought people out in you know, hundreds of thousands perhaps millions in Edinburgh all across the country and now in London as well over the next couple of days um, and they are acting out something that is ancient and they are part of this sort of almost eternal thread but that's that's why the and in, the ritual, in a way the ceremony the pomp is so important but in a way they it? are participating in what you were saying that the queen is somehow small and huge that that, that they themselves being part of this historical moment oh. are like capability brown planting those seeds it's a kind of faith in the future that i find very heartening and, and there's, there's something else as well roger scruton always used to say it's really difficult to describe conservatism because essentially you're describing a feeling what we've mm. had over the last week or so is that feeling playing out on a national scale and it feels as though people are beginning to understand or more people are beginning to understand what we try and intellectualize every week and and, mm -hmm. and, and what everybody on our side of the fence does I, and, yeah. and it's it's seeing it and feeling yeah. it and experiencing it i think it? i think that that is a uh, um cannot be underestimated at that point actually the people are seeing things working out in front of their mm -hmm. eyes that they wouldn't have known rave obviously people will know you've been on gb news it seems like 24 hours <laughs> a day um you're wearing wearing well i've got matchsticks under my <laughs> eyes <at the> <laughs> yeah, yeah. but i'm sure they've got beautiful brocade on them and everything. <laughs> you obviously have been uh, commentating and explaining these particular constitutional ceremonies and everything. Um, do you feel that? I mean, I, I feel that people, I feel this is strengthening our culture. Yes, because people are actually seeing the constitution played out for the first time. This is far better than sitting in a university academic course learning mm. about constitutional law or in a civics class in secondary school. And it goes back to what you're saying. You know, if children can now see how the transition works, how smoothly and flawlessly it works. There are no hanging chads if people remember the uh, the Al Gore George Bush election the Supreme Court having decide whether the, whether a vote counted or not the transition just works there's stability mm. there's there's continuity and in terms of what you were saying earlier I absolutely agree you know the, the Queen regarded the coronation as a sacrament akin to becoming a priest and she, for her it was a covenant between God and herself and between herself mm -hmm. and the people and she fulfilled that covenant now the people the subjects the citizens of this country may not understand it in those terms but they sort of get it that she has fulfilled her covenant she mm -hmm. has fulfilled her promise now it is up to us to say thank you for that mm -hmm. now it is up to us to pay respect and to pay tribute tribute and homage to an honorable woman who has done what she said she would do but also by doing that they are proactively inserting themselves into history mm -hmm. they are becoming part of the fabric of this nation by being able to say well i was there you, mm -hmm. you don't get that in republics. You don't, there's no way to engage with the constitution in a republic. This way, people will say, you know, this woman meant so much to me. I was there. I saw the succession take place. I am now part of history. Do you know the thing is? Sorry, but the thing is actually that there are actual physical manifestations of that. Um, I went and put flowers down in winter at the, um, uh, the, the at the top of the long wall, and which is where most of them are. People were actually, the things they were writing, you had kids writing things and everything, but people were also writing from families, like from the Smith family or something. Um, that very thing, duty done, rest in peace. It was like duty done, in other words, yeah, you kept your side of the bargain, you know, mm -hmm. yeah. which is quite extraordinary, isn't it? And it's, it's uh, unusual as well for um, character traits to be something that is praised because really what people are thanking her for is her loyalty and her mm. service and I think that we never really and uh, you know you were saying about you know, comp comp comparing it with republics that have an elected head of state I think there's something about the monarchy that works because fundamentally at its heart it's true and there's a truth to it whereas I, you can't have an emotional bond or an emotional feeling towards something that doesn't have that truth at the heart of it I think which I think is the way that people fail to emotionally respond to republics. And, and I think part of that truth as well is her stoicism. 
Mm -hmm. um, there's something very real and awe-inspiring and strong about her stoicism and again it contrasts completely with the emotional incontinence and and essentially emotional lies that tend to you know uh, represent our, our the day today it's elizabeth the steadfast yeah. 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 I, in yeah. fact uh, elizabeth actually, the great yeah. it's almost like a, a slightly therapeutic feel to it i mean mm. if you get caught up in a national thing like this mm. Um, you know, you, you forget about all that internal stuff. Actually, mm -hmm. um, but I think it's also I think it's also the fact that we are, people are realizing that we have lost somebody who stood for values and beliefs which aren't around very much any longer. Yeah. This was a supreme champion of civic duty, a supreme champion of self-sacrifice and of service, and indeed of stoicism. Somebody who steered the monarchy away from a celebrity path. Mm -hmm. Somebody who stood for qualities which were once commonplace but now seem to be despised. Mm. And there's a sort of feeling of loss because in this increasingly discombobulated and fractious world, knowing that Her Majesty was there was provided that reassurance, not just constancy mm -hmm. in the rock, but a be belief that those values still existed. And there's mm -hmm. something else there that's a generational thing, isn't there? Because she is of a generation, the generation that won the war, that have pretty much gone now and that generation absolutely represents all of those things you've just been talking about and it's almost like we're saying goodbye to that or amazing are we saying generation the, that's, that's, that's I think I, I, to I see it as Churchill. more of, of the people coming out and saying no we want that well yes exactly well, that's, that's, what that's, I, that's what I mean but, exactly. but she's the last of that and, mm. and and it's she's the last of those people or one of the last of those people there can't be many people left born mm -hmm. in the 1920s but the values but, that she represents yeah, but what I'm saying is you know we're that's why we're responding to her in the way that we are exactly. I think mm -hmm. I think there's yeah, values that exist but there is nobody purveying them on any yeah. platform on the, on, the, on, the, on the national or international no. stage mm -hmm. no, but yeah. they and that's, that's what I meant it's she's very you know we don't want to say goodbye to that we desperately want that to continue and she's the last of that generation that absolutely embody those mm -hmm. things yes I mean by the very nature of coming out and thanking someone for having those tends to suggest that those values are still there mm -hmm. um, but not as you say reflected on the public platform do you think that the coverage has been good I mean I, I have to say I think mostly it's been mm -hmm. impeccable the only th the only thing I know in some ways you know you're, you're biased in this uh, right I think on the whole who has been more critical of the BBC than us <laughs> I think on the whole that they have done a superb job they're obviously not going to you know take any chances with red ties like we have with Peter Sissons or these terrible jokey things that they had at the Diamond Jubilee. Well, threatening to remove a license fee clearly yes, has its exactly. effects and benefits doesn't it? it? Exactly. Well, I, I, it focuses the mind wonderfully. Yes. I've, been, I've been watching uh, GB News rolling the entire time mm. so my entire experience has been watching Rave. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, um, what about I mean one thing the media has highlighted and you can't blame them for doing it, although it does distort the picture, have been these various peripheral protests. I mean, you know, one in Edinburgh, two in Edinburgh, and then a couple of people here and there. And uh, obviously there are people who are now, there's a kind of debate on social media, isn't there? If you b believe in free speech, then um, basically you can't have it one way and not the other. You've got to defend them, which I sort of would kind of agree, but don't you, I don't know whether you agree with this, but it, to me it's not actually a matter of principle. Yes, I would say that they could. It's just a matter of what I'd call just common decency. Yeah. You, you're going to have like months now to make your case. Mm. Why do you have to do it at the funeral? Mm. Well, I think that's precisely it. I mean, we have to be very careful not to be hypocritical. Mm. Yeah. If we want to preserve freedom of speech on our side, we have to be perfectly accepted when it comes from the other side. Um, but. There's plenty of time to protest at the coronation. Mm. I have no objection to that. Mm. Uh, at any of the future events involving the, involving the monarchy in the months ahead. But until Monday, until the funeral is done and, mm. and done and buried, if I can say, they're done and dusted, let's have some decorum. To hurl abuse at the, a son of a mother whose, his, whose coffin mm. he is walking mm. behind is detestable. Yeah. To, um, to hold up signs with vulgarities on them in front of people who are mourning. And this is a family. Now, mm -hmm. that being said, I don't think the police were right to arrest these people. No, no, no. I don't think that they were right. Now, we know the problems with the police. The monarchy never asked for the police to act in this way. Mm -hmm. This, again, is the, is the police over act, overreaching, as they have with Harry Miller and you know, the thought mm -hmm. crimes of Twitter. So they're doing on this side. Let, the, let these people embarrass themselves 
and don't make martyrs of them. And the problem now is Republic, this Republican organization, has now got a chomp is chomping at the bit saying, yeah. look what you this is an attack on free speech. Mm. The monarchy mm. is anti democratic. If the police had just let them alone, people would have been so disgusted uh, by them. The, the, the sheer hypocrisy of it is just is just breathtaking, is that you know the, the, the radical left have been closing down free speech on everything in every mm. institution for years and, and you know it, the anti monarchy, oh great, it's free they're, they're free speech absolutists now. I mean for me let them let these um, people do it. It just shows them how it shows everybody how devoid of human decency they are, and and you know it, it it illustrates the kind of world we would have, the kind their kind of world. Do mm -hmm. we want their world? Of course we don't. Let them let them scream and shout as much as they want. In fact, another kind of world I wouldn't particularly like is 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 an official one, and that is the uh, American media's um, coverage, mm. which um, not in total. But when you consider they were and are our main ally, etc., always very, very fond of the Queen, um, you've got people talking about colonialism and why, you know, this on on mainstream Again, channels, no sense of decorum. No or sense of decorum, but also sheer ignorance. Mm -hmm. But sheer also, ignorance. Also allied with the American university system, the, the really shocking thing is some of the absolute filth come from yes, yes. major uh, American institutions in you know in, in, in com you know in the same thing as the uh, as the press um, it, the American university system has become a, a, a circus sideshow of race baiting it's just mm. completely bizarre it's just finished. it's also interesting how um, how removed from the facts the yeah. critics have been so mm. I've had a lot of people contacting me via social media trying I guess they think to call out our side of the debate the free speech um, mm. free speech warriors um, for not speaking out in criticism of this when in fact everybody pretty quickly did. straight the, away the free, everybody did the free speech away. union released a statement yeah. the free speech union reached out to the person who'd been arrested and offered assistance mm. um, but actually the same people who have been attacking the monarchy for colonialism and so on um, and you know accusing the Queen of being in some way directly involved in all sorts of atrocities and deaths and so on um, that the the hypocrisy that they are accusing the right of the people who are pro free speech and therefore somehow defined as being right wing they're accusing them of hypocrisy with you know when the facts completely contradict it because everybody is being outspoken against it but actually like you say the hypocrisy is, has been that those people who are critical about colonialism and so on um, that they are the ones who so readily would have people arrested and censored for saying things that are offensive but when somebody is yelling at a funeral going by suddenly they are they're in favor of free speech and mm. think that they can call out the, the usual free speech um, warriors for it so um, it, it's it, well, well, hypo there's hypocrisy on the one hand and there's dishonesty on the yeah. other so what they so do is they take a, a, a historical a historical event and and completely misrepresent it or just outline lie about it and what people do is look at it and think my god that's terrible and accept it because they don't have the time or inclination to research into it think oh my god that's completely and utterly wrong so I've done that a couple of times online and a few other people have done that as well and we've pushed back on it and that's what we've really got to do because that's how social justice warriors work they throw a lie out there it, it's it looks and sounds reprehensible and because people don't have the time or inclination they, they, they don't mm -hmm. they don't push back on it so so people that that who are in the business need to do that yes in the business yeah uh, they need to I think that there's one big pushback going on which people don't even think is a pushback at the moment and that's been the reaction to uh, this past week um, I think um, mm -hmm. as uh, you started by saying Rafe uh, it is quite extraordinary to me to see a country that had fallen from view should we say um, speaking of which um, I'd never been a great and of Prince Charles, um, I found that actually I was a great example of this thing of where allegiance simply goes from one to the other. Mm -hmm. And now I've been hugely impressed. And um, you know, suddenly he seems to have overnight grown into something to the point where you sort of think, well, actually, this must be just me projecting. But actually, he just seemed very kingly. And it's that voice, actually. Yeah. The Queen 
uh, obviously we're very used to her speaking. Charles has got almost a theatrical voice about him, which I think actually is going to really serve him very, very well. Do you think, I mean, it's a honeymoon, but <laughs> it's a good start, isn't it? It's a very good start. I mean, I, I looked at him and I'd never really thought of him as, as being a queen and, and uh, a, a king and, and like you, a queen. <laughs> and and, and who knows? hope. <laughs> who knows? Uh, but uh, like you, um, I was flabbergasted. You know, I, uh, yes, he is the king. It's like someone poured two chemicals together and, and he's the king, you know. Um, but you said that quite a quite a while ago. I can't remember yeah. what it was on. You, you you said that people will will just accept him and will think of him as the well, king. I think it's a form seems to be more than accepted. There's a poll out today um, which showing that he's uh, approval rating has gone from suddenly from 39 percent which yeah. has always been around up to 61 mm -hmm. 63 63 yeah I think though going back to what we were saying about the r relationship the emotional relationship with the royal family being a familial one mm -hmm. the way that I view it is that you don't choose who your family are mm -hmm. and so while my views of Prince Charles is past behavior the views that he's expressed and so on and in some cases the people he's associated with whilst I still have my views about those things he is still my king mm. he's our king um, and that is you, you know you don't get to choose the character of the person when he is when he is anointed in the coronation ceremony even more so and so like you were saying about your allegiance switching as it really is it totally embodied in um, and it, actually I was at a, a, a dinner the night after everybody heard about this and um, John O'Sullivan stood up and said the Queen is dead long live the King and it really is that switch and suddenly you know he is the he is the king and my loyalty is to the crown and to the institution of monarchy and with that comes a love of the monarch regardless of the fact of his character he will be molded by the and role I, uh, and i uh, actually feel quite are you, optimistic in some ways are you Not, or are you more skeptical right no i've never been skeptical i've always said that he should no 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 the or of the long term but um, my, my point was whether or not you agree with his views on various issues nobody can deny that the motivation is genuine sincerity to improve the country mm. no one can say that he has an, an ulterior motive to undermine the nation and that's the key aspect here we're so lucky to have somebody who's devoted their lives the longest apprenticeship in history having to find a role for himself as mm. prince of wales everything he's done it has in his mind be for, for the betterment of britain we could have had a playboy prince we could have had somebody who spent the last 50 years in Monte Carlo on the roulette wheels. Instead <laughs> we had somebody actively engaged and there's a very very good letter he wrote in 93 which is published in David Dimbleby's biography of him in which he he's li lists his motivation in, in all of his activities and he said I want to make Great Britain great again. Mm -hmm. I want to put the great back in and that means to me looking after agriculture but also getting a professional military and he lists all of these things which no traditional conservative could have any objection to mm. it's a remarkable list to go through and uh, uh, at, the, at the end of it he said you know he, he says I want to roll back the 1960s mm. and all of the terrible results of architecture art mm. music and you think well who could do <laughs> who could yes, not exactly. say and that's, <laughs> but the key thing where do I put my was cross in, was yeah. in his first was in his <laughs> first speech he said I understand as king I will not have time mm. for the interests and charities I was previously involved with and, and, and I think we have to take him he understands he's not a thing. fool he said I'm not a fool mm. before I know when I'm king I have mm. to be different mm. so yes I'm absolutely behind the man now as long as he keeps to his word and keeps the activism at bay yeah, I mean, when he when he said he would he would put the politics to one side, yes, it, it was that. that yeah. But it was it was coupled with the sheer emotion of of, of that speech, and 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 I, I was just watching it, and I was just absolutely in awe. Again, I've said that twice now. I really was, and I thought, yes, you 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 know you can do this. You can you can you can stand up to this. He he looked every inch the king and, and, and he acted it and he, he, was, he wasn't playing it, acting is the wrong word, he wasn't playing it, he was being it and I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful for the future, I'm hopeful for the future. Speaking of the future, uh, you know, although we've talked endlessly here, haven't we, about the way schools indoctrinate young people and everything, all I can say is that um, down in like Windsor at the Long Walk or, in, or indeed in London, central London here, I would say that half the crowd, if not more, have been under 40. Mm -hmm. You know, there is this view of 
Royal fans being, oh, you know, we used to call blue rinse hair and all the rest of it, like the Tory party conference. Not at all. Young families, teenagers, single people, whatever, all coming with flowers. Mm. So that, that to me, gives the light and, to, to that. And time. children leaving their teddy bears. Yes. And I saw, um, it was probably on GP News, um, uh, that some of the notes that had been written said things like, please look after my teddy bear. Mm. And you know, children handing over their toys and leaving little Paddington bears mm. and little marmalade, marmalade sandwiches yes. in plastic bags with for later written on do, it. Do you, know, do you know what it is? It's the difference between the media version of Britain and mm -hmm. actual Britain, you know, mm. and, and, and we, we're, what we're seeing now is actual Britain. Well, actually, in terms of the, the s split, the media version of Scotland versus the actual version of Scotland. I wonder if Nicola Sturgeon will have had a look at those yeah. crowds oh, no, and yeah. thought yeah. maybe yeah. this isn't yeah. the time after yeah. all. Um, yes. Um, finally, uh, people talked about a memorial. I mean, or rather, people talked about statues of the Queen for quite a long time. Uh, there used to be a convention that uh, you should wait till the monarch's gone. Um, although I don't know how they got round that with Queen Victoria, all the statues of, you know, from the Diamond Jubilee. Queen Victoria, date from that time. But anyway, um, Simon Heffer has written a piece talking about a statue. He thinks there should be a statue of the Queen and a fountain, possibly in Parliament Square. So in other words, not on the fourth plinth. You know, the fourth plinth in Trafalgar Square in London is where those hideous um, pieces of trash art are put up in order to mock uh, the rest of the square, let's face it. Um, how would the Queen best be commemorated in marble or stone in your view and where question of the week i i agree with simon i think it should be in parliament square and i think he said something about an equestrian type um, mm -hmm. uh, statue i think that would be marvelous i don't think it should be in trafalgar square it shouldn't be on that fourth plinth it should be it should be permanent i know you, that it would be permanent anyway there but i think it should be a million miles away from the nonsense that mm -hmm. that fourth plinth mm -hmm. represents um. I, I I agree. Although I, I why limit ourselves to one statue? Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. I I also think that there are some absolutely beautiful photographs of the Queen cer ceremonial on horseback, mm -hmm. and she looks so regal and so powerful. Mm -hmm. I think that that that's, that a, a sculpture made of one of those photographs mm -hmm. would be just magisterial, mm -hmm. and that there should be at least one primary large statue in a very prominent place in in the most whatever the most prominent place would be in parliament square for example but i also think that um you know in in favor of local people organizing themselves we saw so much of that interest through save our statues mm. that um there should be help for local people to organize themselves to get local statues as well we should have statues of her all around the country certainly maybe. because that was that was what statues were all have always been about it's been about local people you know getting their public own statues yeah public, yeah, yeah. public subscription i prefer parliament square to be a, a square for statesmen I've never been too happy with it being used for, for other purposes and we've seen that now with and actually British statesman I don't know why Nelson Mandela is there for example Gandhi and, also and again Gandhi as well I just don't understand the logic behind that now the reason that they've got the temporary exhibitions on the fourth plinth mm. is because the intention had always been to put the Queen there mm. and yeah. that this was basically just a way to keep mm. it going the problem is though I think the elites of our society are so happy with the temporary mm. exhibitions there they become so iconic and connected to the art gallery, but I don't think they would actually support the Queen now going on to this thing. Well, I know well, I, I know someone quite well who's who commissions those monstrosities. Actually, also, so it makes it makes a mockery yeah. of the statue. Yeah, then exactly. Yeah, yeah. So it was it was meant to be for William the Fourth originally, mm, but then yeah. he never paid the bill, so the statue <laughs> never ended up going up there. But I, but there must be at least one. But I would think more than one statue going up in, in London of Her Majesty so great as so. I would like to see one equestrian one, for example, mm -hmm. in Hyde Park mm -hmm. or something. Yeah. Like it would Gardens. be nice to have something on the scale of the Victoria Monument outside of Buckingham Palace, something that is that. Yeah. Just, sorry, just just to finish the point about the fourth plinth. I, I, like I say, I know the a person who who's on the committee to for, for those, and um, I don't think um, you know they're not going to change, and they're not going to let go of that fourth plinth. That's oh, they're I mean, not. Yeah. Yeah. That's what I mean. Yeah. yeah. Yes, you're quite right. It was actually it was meant to be six mm. months each. Mm. Uh, just keep it going but of course I think possibly these things become entrenched because yeah. of course when they started that the Queen was already old they probably didn't think she was going to live this long um, I'm, I'm with you on a big statue 
Bearing in mind, there already are statues around the country. There's one in, I think it's Gravesend, mm. which is a lovely one. Uh, it, it's remarkable. Why Gravesend, actually? But it's a great seated one in the Garza Road. Well, of mm. course, and you helped erect one in Runnymede. That's Mead. right, in Runnymede. Um, and uh, that's, again, in a, uh, a useful one. And then there's also one um, in Bexley Heath, <laughs> uh, which if you live near Bexley Heath, uh, anyone, anyone watching, there's a clock tower in the middle of Bexley Heath by the shopping centre there. And there was a, an empty, sort of what you'd call cameo, what an uh, alcove in it. And it's now got a statue of the Queen. But anyway, these are small ones. We need something big. We n we're talking Albert Memorial. I well, think, hopefully, yeah? hopefully Charles will have some kind of input into it with his yes. traditionalism to make sure that mm -hmm. it's not one of those awful modern type statues, that it's actually something that is elegant yes. and traditional. Yes, I don't want, I'm not interested in anyone else's interpretation. Yeah. We want majesty. We don't want brutalism. <laughs> we don't we want, want brutalism. Majesty. Yes. I think we can put brutalism to bed now that the king is king. <laughs> yes. yes. <laughs> That's a, on a very, very happy note, actually. To end Obviously, we've got the uh, funeral next week um, but Emma thanks so much oh, thanks Ray and uh, that's it and um, we shall see you next week bye bye hello if you're enjoying the new culture forum channel and you believe in our mission may I invite you to join our membership scheme at the link below or on our website newcultureforum.org.uk our work is more important now than ever, and we have great plans ahead for the future, but we can't do it without your support. From as little as £3 per month, you can help ensure that we continue on our mission. As a member, you'll receive a range of benefits, including access to exclusive content, invitations to our private events, including here at our studios, free copies of our books, and much, much more, including, of course, our famous NCF mug. If you aren't able to become a member, then please help us by clicking this button and subscribing to our channel. It's completely free. Just remember to also click the bell icon so that you can get notifications when we post new videos. Thank you.